According to modern geology, our world is over four and a half billion years old, and its geological features have been sculpted over vast eons of time. Everyone knows that planet Earth is unimaginably ancient. It's common knowledge that geological forces have acted slowly over millions of years to form the rocks beneath our feet. But what if what everyone knows is wrong? In this program, we're taking a journey around the British Isles, the place where modern geology was born. As we experience this spectacular scenery, more inspiring landscapes, and beautiful coastlines, we begin a visual odyssey of discovery. We're also going to ask some important questions. Were the rocks around us formed slowly and gradually? Or suddenly during catastrophic events? Did the history of the world unfold over vast eras of time or much shorter periods? And what do the rocks really tell us about the geological history of our world? So join us as we take a closer look at Earth's catastrophic past. We begin our journey on the east coast of Scotland, about 40 miles from Edinburgh. Sicker Point is a site of international scientific importance visited by many parties of geologists and students every year. It was just over 200 years ago that the pioneering geologist James Hutton came by boat to Sicker Point with his colleagues John Playfair and James Hall. What they saw here was to lead to a revolution in our understanding of the history of the earth. Well here we are at Sicker Point, um, perhaps one of the most famous geological sites anywhere in the world a place where an old established worldview was completely overturned. This is where Hutton and his friends Playfair and Hall came in 1788 and observed this famous location. And yeah. from the observations they made here, uh, they convinced everyone uh, that the Earth was not 6,000 years old, uh, but it, that, that it was uh, perhaps millions of years old, didn't they? That's right, and Hutton famously said he could contemplating these rocks here, he could see no vestige of a beginning or prospect of an end. Not much more than a century before Hutton, most naturalists and scientists had been men of great religious conviction. They accepted the historical accounts recorded in the Bible and believed that the early chapters of the book of Genesis provided the key to unlocking the mysteries of the Earth's past. They included men like Thomas Burnett, who argued that the present surface of the earth had been shaped by the catastrophic worldwide flood that took place in the days of Noah. Another was John Woodward, who thought that the fossils enclosed in the rock layers were the remains of creatures that had perished during the catastrophe. Both men were leading thinkers of their day and implicitly trusted what the Bible said about the history of the world. They saw the rocks and fossils as a silent testimony to the events of creation and the flood. But over the next few decades, there was a growing separation in people's minds between scientific truths and religious truths. The Bible came to be regarded as a source of moral and religious instruction, but not as a reliable source of knowledge about the physical world. Consciously or otherwise, scholars began to explain the natural world without any reference to God. 
The biblical events of creation and the flood were sidelined in favor of increasingly speculative ideas about the Earth's past. However, it was not until James Hutton came along that a completely new approach to geology would take root, one that would overturn the biblical catastrophism of the past. While working on his family farm in Berwickshire, Hutton observed the way in which erosion gradually wore away at the rocks and sediments slowly accumulated in streams, lakes and rivers. He came to believe that these same slow processes operating over vast periods of time were sufficient to explain how the Earth's rock layers had formed in the more distant past. There was no place in Hutton's mind for catastrophic global floods like the one described in the Bible. It was while he was developing these theories about geological processes that Hutton came to Sicker Point, triggering an earthquake in the science of geology which still reverberates to this day. So what did Hutton and his friends see when they came here to Sicker Point in 1788? Well, magnificently exposed here on the foreshore are two sets of rock layers. Uh, the first set of rock layers are the vertical layers that you can see behind me in this face here. Uh, these are layers of sandstone and mudstone, and they're standing up on end. They're oriented vertically. And then Hutton noticed that there were other rock layers which were horizontal above the vertical layers. They're the layers that I'm sitting on here, these uh, reddish sandstone layers. And Hutton realized that you could read the story in the rocks like the story in a book. And he began to realize that uh, he, as he thought about cycles of uh, erosion and sedimentation, it, here was a geological sequence of events. Uh, layers of sandstone and mudstone had been laid down horizontally on the floor of an ocean. And then there'd been an episode of folding, an uplift, so those rock layers were now standing vertically on end. And then they'd been eroded uh, by some geological process. And then uh, there'd been an episode of subsidence and more sediments had been laid down horizontally on top. Uh, this structure is what geologists now call an angular unconformity. And to Hutton, who had been thinking about how slowly erosion and sedimentation take place today, he'd observed slow stream erosion, he knew how slowly sediments were building up in lakes and rivers and oceans today, he realized that if those same rates had applied in the past, then to form uh, this structure at Sicker Point must have taken vast ages of time. In the 19th century, Hutton's views were taken up by the geologist and lawyer Sir Charles Lyell. Lyell is credited with developing one of the most fundamental geological principles, the principle of uniformitarianism, often summed up in the phrase, the present is the key to the past. Like Hutton, Lyell believed that the same processes of erosion and sedimentation that could be observed today had always operated. But he went even further than Hutton in assuming that they had done so at strictly uniform rates. His popularization of this approach was enormously successful, and the uniformitarian dogma came to be adopted by virtually the entire geological community of his generation. His book even had an influence on the emerging theory of evolution when it was read by a young naturalist named Charles Darwin. For the next 150 years, the theories of Hutton and Lyell dominated geological thinking. Catastrophism of the kind embraced by earlier generations was considered out of bounds. But the nagging doubts of some geologists wouldn't go away. The evidence in the rocks didn't always fit comfortably with the gradualism of Hutton and Lyell. Many rock layers pointed to processes more rapid and violent than those going on at the present day. Eventually, these growing doubts led some geologists to reconsider the evidence for catastrophism and to move away from the more rigid forms of uniformitarianism. So much so that within the last 40 years, belief in large-scale geological catastrophes, once regarded almost as heresy, has become fashionable again, even mainstream. 
One of the leading proponents of this new catastrophism was Derek Ager, formerly professor of geology at Swansea University and one time president of the Geologists Association. Ager's books make for thought-provoking reading. In one of them he wrote, We've allowed ourselves to be brainwashed into avoiding any interpretation of the past that involves extreme and what might be termed catastrophic processes. Ager emphasized that the geological record was full of examples of processes that were far from normal and that sedimentation had often been very rapid and very spasmodic. Among the evidence for catastrophism to which Ager pointed were rock layers which appeared to have been formed rapidly during storms, hurricanes or typhoons. With tongue in cheek, he would refer to these as Tuesday afternoon deposits in order to convey how quickly they must have been laid down. One of Ager's favorite examples was found on the coast, not far from his home in Swansea, South Wales, seen here on a very wet and foggy afternoon. Exposed along the shore near the village of Ogmore by Sea is a pebbly rock layer, about three feet thick, called the Sutton Stone. Most geologists have supposed that the Sutton Stone was laid down along the shoreline of an advancing ocean, a beach deposit that took perhaps five million years to be laid down. However, there are some curious features of this rock formation that are inconsistent with the idea of slow accumulation. When we look at a modern pebbly beach, we see that the pebbles are in contact with one another. Each pebble rests on other pebbles, just like the raisins in this bowl. That's what the Sutton Stone should look like if it had formed as a slowly accumulating beach deposit. But careful examination reveals that the pebbles in the Sutton Stone are floating within a mass of finer sediment. In fact, they're more like the raisins in this piece of raisin cake suspended within the finer cake mix. This is an important observation. Pebbles floating in a mass of finer sediment are characteristic of what geologists call mass flow deposits, including those laid down by hurricanes, tsunamis and severe tropical storms. Based on his careful study of the Southern Stone, Derek Eger concluded that it must have been deposited by an enormous wave of water carrying mud and pebbles, which dumped them together to form this layer. Far from being deposited slowly over five million years, the Sutton Stone had been formed in a single, sudden event. This was too much for some geologists, who challenged his reinterpretation of the Sutton Stone, but Eger himself remained unbowed. Whatever caused the layer to be deposited, he insisted it must have happened very quickly. The evidence favored catastrophism, not the slow accumulation of pebbles on an ancient beach. But it's not just in the laying down of sediments that catastrophism has made a comeback. In recent years, there's been a re-evaluation of other fields of geology too. Our time to go back to where we began to ask whether James Hutton drew the right conclusions from the rocks that he studied. Was Hutton correct when he said that there was conclusive evidence of long geological timescales at Sicker Point? It's time to take a second look at Sicker Point and see some of the things that James Hutton seemed to have missed. First of all, notice these gray wackies. Uh, the sandstones right here are very resistant to erosion and tend to stand out whereas the shales in the middle right here weather out very quickly. And this is what modern coastal erosion does. Modern erosion differentially weathers the softer shales and the more resistant sandstones stand out. We don't see that underneath of the flat unconformity that was described by James Hutton. Instead, the shales and the sandstones are uniformly worn away. And we think that's evidence that this contact was made very quickly and not exposed for long periods of time, as Hutton suggested. What could have caused the hard and soft layers to be planed off equally? Slow and gradual erosion today always produces an uneven surface. But the evidence at Sicker Point suggests the kind of violent and sheet-like erosion associated with the runoff of water during a catastrophic event. One of the other things to notice here at Sicker Point is the nature of this breccia bed, which is directly above 
the unconformity surface, above the erosion surface. And if we take a close look at it, we can see that it's made up of broken pieces of other rocks, uh, including the rocks that are found below uh, the unconformity, the Silurian grey wackies, the shales and sandstones. And uh, when we take a look at these pieces of broken rock, we find that there's a whole range of sizes, from very small fragments to much larger fragments. Uh, we also find that the fragments are very angular. They have jagged, sharp edges. And what this tells us is that this deposit did not take very long to be laid down. If these fragments had been rolling around on an ancient surface for a long time, they would have become sorted and graded by size and shape, and the edges would have become smoothed and rounded. And everything that we see here in this breccia deposit tells us that it was laid down rapidly and catastrophically. Clearly, there wasn't enough time for the eroded cobbles and boulders to become smooth and rounded and sorted by size and shape. It seems that whatever eroded the unconformity surface must have done so quickly. And what about the rock layers below the unconformity? Closer examination reveals evidence that they were also laid down rapidly. The rocks that I'm sitting on are these Silurian grey wackies. And these we now know are turbidite deposits. And turbidites form very quickly in modern settings. Uh, there's a sandstone portion to the turbidite and then a finer grain shale portion to the turbidite. Um, this entire sequence right here was one quick event that probably was made within minutes. We have dozens and dozens of these rapidly deposited turbidite beds at Sikar Point. The evidence at Sikar Point indicates catastrophic processes and short time scales, with sediments being laid down and eroded rapidly. But during his visit in 1788, James Hutton apparently failed to understand the significance of the evidence in front of him. He assumed that the present was the key to understanding the past, and therefore concluded that large amounts of time must have passed as these sediments were laid down, uplifted and eroded, and new sediments deposited on top. But closer examination of these rocks now causes us to question this assumption. Hutton was a real pioneer when it came to geologic thought. He was able to show the world that history was preserved in the rocks that he studied. However, Hutton proposed the idea of uniformitarianism. He said that long, gradual processes were recorded in the rocks. As we looked at the rocks at Sikar Point, we did not see evidence for those long, gradual processes. Instead, we saw evidence for rapid, catastrophic processes, processes that happened very quickly over short periods of time. Well, we began our journey and we've ended our journey here at Sicker Point. And along the way, we visited some spectacular coastlines, much loved countryside, and some iconic geological sites. And what we've seen is that the evidence in the rocks doesn't support James Hutton's dogma of uniformitarianism. We've seen evidence of vast sedimentary rock layers, evidence of fast moving currents, evidence of explosive volcanoes and the role that all these things have played in the formation of the landscape we see around us here in Great Britain. James Hutton's dogma of uniformitarianism may have triumphed in the geological community for almost 200 years, but perhaps it did so in spite of the evidence and not because of it. In the 21st century, a new approach to geology is needed. Perhaps a revolution as radical as the one brought about by Hutton in the 18th century. While catastrophic processes have been rediscovered in the last few decades, they are still locked into the idea of long geological timescales and continue to be regarded as rare events that punctuated an otherwise tranquil past. Today, we need to see catastrophism for what it is, the dominant force that has shaped our geological history. We have seen that the evidence for large-scale catastrophic events colossal eruptions, massive storms and gigantic floods is all around us. Catastrophism is alive and well on planet Earth and the evidence is rock solid. <laughs>